So what I want to do now is I want to go through some example EKGs, kind of using the whole method that we have here to kind of just show you how going through this method works. Um, and also kind of show you some other EKGs that are important to know that we haven't really covered yet. So let's start off with this first person. The first person, the first thing that we do when we look at an EKG is name and date, right? So we see the name here, we see the date, then we quickly glance at the speed and gain, we see that those are normal, and then we could start looking at the EKG. So the first thing we look at is rate rhythm axis. Starting off with rate, just by quickly looking at this, we see that this is a pretty fast rate. So the best thing to use with a fast rate is the box method, not necessarily counting. Looking at this first heartbeat, we see that, looking at lead one, that the QRS complexes are pretty close to the big um, boxes at the beginning of the box. So we could kind of start uh, by counting big boxes. So one, two, we see that the there's two big boxes between the QRS complexes. So this would be 300 over two or 150 beats per minute. Whenever I'm reading KG, especially when I started off, I would write down my interpretation in the top right corner here because then when you're presenting this EKG to your, to your attending, your fellow, whoever it may be, you don't have to think on the fly, you just read off what you read. So rate, we have 150 beats per minute. Next, we determine the rhythm. So we already noted that it's fast, so it's a tachycardia. Now, is the QRS narrow or wide? We see that it's narrow, okay? So it's a narrow complex tachycardia, and is it beating regularly or irregularly? We see that the intervals are regular. So this is a narrow complex regular tachycardia. Um, in the tachycardia lectures, we'll talk about what these types can be, um, but just quickly reading through it right now, we know that this is a narrow regular um, complex tachycardia. So we have the rate, we have the rhythm. Next, let's look at axis. So for axis, we look at one and AVF, and we see that one is positive, so your left thumb is up. AVF is positive, so your right thumb is up. So this is a normal axis. So after we did rate, rhythm, axis, let's look at intervals. Looking at the P waves here, it's hard to see where they are, and it's likely due to the fact that this is a regular neural complex tachycardia. So it's hard for us to assess the PR interval. The QRS, like we mentioned, is narrow. And the T, if we look here, it looks like it's a little bit more than half of the R to R interval. But remember that with fast heart rates, we have to look at the QTC because the uh, QT interval is affected by how fast the heart is beating. So this is where looking at the QTC that's created by the EKG itself would be helpful. After we look at the intervals, we then look for the most important thing, right? Ischemia. So going from left to right, top to bottom, we start with lead one. Here, if we draw a line, we see that there's maybe some SD depressions in one. Going to two, we also see some SD depressions. Three is pretty normal. You don't really see any Q waves, no T wave inversions, no peak T waves, no ST elevations or depressions. Moving on to AVR, here we do see some ST elevations. So we mentioned in our prior lecture that SC elevations in AVR are a little bit tricky, um, and we'll talk about that shortly, but we see a clear ST elevation here in AVR. AVL, no significant ischemic changes. AVF, we see some ST depressions again. Looking at V1, no significant changes. V2, we do see ST depressions that are more significant in V3, even more so in V4 and then V5, V6 also show this. So putting this all together, we have a narrow complex regular tachycardia, normal axis. Um, the PR intervals is hard to interpret. Q QRS is narrow, QT, we would have to check the QTC. And then checking for the ischemia, we see that there is an ST elevation in AVR, and then there's pretty much diffuse ST depressions everywhere. Right, so we have in one, two, three AVF, and then V two through V six. So this would be concerning for something called left main disease, uh, and this is someone that has to go to the cath lab right away. 
because they have an ST elevation AVR and there's diffuse reciprocal ST depressions um, throughout the EKG. So this is concerning that there might be ischemia at the beginning of the LAD or at the left main, or this person has diffuse uh, three vessel disease. So this is a good EKG to kind of keep in mind when you're thinking about STEMIs because the only ST elevation in this EKG is an AVR. So now moving to our next EKG here. We first look at name, we look at date, then we look at the speed and the gain, both are normal. Then we start off with rate, rhythm, axis. My apologies, the, the EKG paper didn't really come out that well, so it's hard to see the actual big boxes except towards the end here. But seeing as we don't have the boxes, we could count. And these QRS complexes are a little bit funky, but if we look at V1, we count the QRS complex, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So then we have 13 times 6, that's 78. So this person's 78 beats per minute, that's their rate. Rhythm, we look for P waves before the QRS complexes. And we don't really see any P waves, right? Looking at V1, it's kind of the cleanest uh, tracing. We don't see any P waves. And then looking for P waves in 1 and 2, we also don't necessarily see them there either. So it's hard to say if this is a normal sinus rhythm. Um, but we know that it's beating at 78 beats per minute. Looking at the axis, looking at 1 in AVF, it's really hard to say. I mean, the QRS's complexes are really weird. Uh, so it's hard to say what the axis is here. And then when we start looking at intervals, PR, we don't see any P waves. But QT, looking specifically in the precordial leads in V1 through V3, we see that this is clearly prolonged. And if we look at actually the V1 tracing towards the end here, and we measure it, we see that it's more than one box. So this would be more than 200 milliseconds, which is greater than the 120 millisecond limit for... Uh, QRS complexes. And like we mentioned, if you have a prolonged QRS, you start thinking bundle branch blocks. So if we look at one and we see that it's predominantly negative, then we know this is a left bundle branch block. However, the interesting with this EK, the interesting thing with this EKG uh, is that these QRS complexes are super wide. And as you can tell, looking at V1, this kind of starts to look almost like a sine wave. And when you start seeing sine waves, you start thinking of one particular thing, and that's hyperkalemia. And that's what actually happened in this patient, is they had a potassium of 7.8, and they went for urgent dialysis because they went into acute renal failure. So this is an EKG of significant, significant hyperkalemia. You have this prolonged QRS complex, and then you have these sine waves that are forming. In hyperkalemia, you also can see, obviously, the peak T waves, um, but patients could also develop AV blocks. So this is a patient with potassium 7.8 who is starting to develop sine waves. Moving on to our next EKG. So we look at the name, it's the right name. We look at the date, it's the right date. Quickly look at the speed and the gain, those are normal. Now we look at rate, rhythm, axis. So here we see that the rate is very, very slow. So if we look at the QRS complexes, we see that they're really far apart. And if we say this is one whole rhythm strip or one whole EKG, then we would probably count it out, right? So we have one, two, three, just four QRS complexes. So four times six would be 24. So this is a very slow rhythm. And moving or coming and thinking about our AV block lecture, we were saying that whenever you have rhythms that are very, very slow in the 20s, you should be thinking ventricular rhythms, okay? So talking about rhythms, right? We see the P waves here, but they're not really that close to the QRS complexes. Here it's a little bit closer, but they're not evenly spaced. So you should start thinking whenever you have such a slow heart rate that this is probably complete heart block. You see that the P waves are kind of marching out at their own rate, and the QRS complexes are also evenly spaced. So this is complete heart block. Just quickly checking, make sure there's no ischemia, right? 
we look for any ST changes, Q waves, T wave inversions. And here, looking at V1 and V2 and V3, we see that there seems to be a slight ST elevation. V3 maybe could be two blocks. And like we were mentioning, this person does have left ventricular hypertrophy. So the QRS complexes are pretty long here. It's going off the page. So it's possible that this left ventricular hypertrophy or the um, left bundle branch block could be causing this slight ST elevation. But it'd be important that if this patient is coming in with a new third degree heart block, they'll make sure that they're not having a STEMI or ischemia that's causing this. So this patient would have third degree heart block with a left bundle branch block. And if we look at the axis, we look at one, which is up, AVF, which is down. So they would have a left axis deviation as well and no significant ischemia. Moving on to the next EKG. So we check the name, it's the right person, it's the right date, normal speed, normal gain, rate rhythm axis. Here we could go either way. We see that maybe the rhythm's like in between, it's not too fast, it's not too slow. So we could use either the box method or counting. If we use the box method, we see that this first beat kind of starts off nicely on a big box. So if we count one, two, three, four, five boxes, 300 over 5 is 60, so this patient's heart rate would be around 60 beats per minute. Looking at the rate, or the rhythm, we check for P's before every QRS. So looking at this, it looks like these are what seems to be P waves, however, they're not regular. So this makes you start thinking of something particularly. If you don't see any regular P waves, you should be thinking of AFib, right? However, what's interesting here is when we think of AFib, we should be thinking about irregular rhythms, while these QRS complexes are evenly spaced. And they're evenly spaced, so whenever you think that the P waves are not corresponding to the QRS complexes, we start thinking along third degree AV block, right? Like on the prior EKG. But we have to first analyze the QRS complex and we see that this is a narrow complex QRS. So it's probably coming from around the junction, so the AV node. So what this actually is in terms of rhythm, it's atrial fibrillation, because you don't have these P waves, you just have kind of this fibrillatory P waves with a junctional escape. What that means is that it's a slow AFib and the AV node is the one that's predominantly creating um, the ventricular depolarization. So that's the rhythm. Next thing we want to look at is the axis. So we look at one, it's positive. Look at AVF, it's positive, so it's a normal axis. Then we look at the intervals, like we said, we can't look at the PR interval because this patient's in AFib. QRS is narrow. QT looks rather normal. It's less than half the RR. We would check the QTC on the paper. And then we check for ischemia. So starting at the top here, one, there's some ST depressions. Two, you don't really see in this first beat, but in the second beat, you see that there seems to be ST elevations. And then looking at three, you definitely see some ST elevations in three, similarly in AVF. So that's concerning. To continue with going through to make sure that there's no other ischemia in EKG, AVR, none there. AVL, there's some ST depressions. Uh, looking at V1, it looks like maybe slight elevations, but in the second B, it looks to be flatter. V2, flat. V3, flat. V4, there's some ST depressions. V5, there's some ST depressions. And V6, there's some ST depressions. So this patient has this slow AFib with junctional escape, and then these ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF, which are the inferior leads. And remember, the inferior leads are the ones that supply the RCA. So the RCA is the one that supplies the SA node and the AV node. So it's very possible this patient developed atrial fibrillation with this junctional escape because they have ischemia um, to the RCA to those nodes. So it would be interesting to know that if this patient just developed this AFib, it's likely due to the STEMI that they're having. Now let's move on to our last EKG.
So here, looking at the names, the right names, the right date, speed and gain are normal. We look at the rate first and counting the boxes here, we have one, two, three, four boxes, so 300 over four, we have 75 beats per minute. Looking at the rhythm, we check for P waves before every QRS. We don't really see P waves before every QRS, but we do see these little spikes right beforehand. And those spikes actually then cause this wide complex QRS. It has this negative deflection in V1, so it looks like a left bundle branch block. And it seems to create these very long QRS complexes kind of being concerned for left ventricular hypertrophy. So whenever you see these kind of tick marks right before the QRS complex, you should be thinking that this patient has a pacemaker in place. And that's, that was the case with this patient. They actually were ventricularly paced and we know that from the EKG because there's this pacer spike right before a QRS complex. Whenever someone is paced, they will have, in, especially ventricularly paced, they will have a wide complex QRS. If they are atrially paced, you'll see a spike right before the P wave and then a normal QRS complex because the conduction is going down still the AV hyperkinji uh, system. However, when it's ventricularly paced, the pacemaker is in the left ventricle, or sorry, in the right ventricle, and it's pacing from there, creating what looks like uh, a left bundle branch block in a wide QRS. So this is a, a ventricularly paced rhythm, but to kind of keep on going, so uh, after that we have the axis, so one seems to be positive, AVF is negative, so this is a left axis deviation which makes sense because it's a ventricularly paced rhythm. Then looking at the PR intervals, like we said, we don't see it because it's paced. QRS we mentioned is wide. QT seems to be less than the R to R interval. Then looking for ischemia, one has a T wave, a negative T wave. Uh, two, don't really see any ST changes. Three, might show some ST elevations. Uh, AVF as well, but like we said, this is a paced rhythm, which it creates a left bundle branch block and left ventricular hypertrophy, which can kind of pull up that QRS complex. So it'd be important to kind of um, compare it to prior EKGs to see if there's any changes. And there's actually all this criteria uh, for checking for ischemia whenever patients have left bundle branch blocks and left ventricular hypertrophy. That criteria is known as Scarbosa criteria but that's not something you have to know. That's more so kind of for cardiologists or ED doctors. Going through the rest of it, looking at AVR, there's some T-wave inversions there, AVL, also maybe some ST depressions, looking at v the precordial leads, V1, maybe some slight ST elevations, V2, some slight ST elevations, and maybe peak T-waves, V3, the same thing, V4 as well, V5, some ST depressions, and V6, some ST depressions. So putting this all together, it's mainly a ventricularly paced rhythm at 75 beats per minute with left axis deviation and left bundle branch blocks, along with some ischemic changes that we would have to kind of compare to and look at the patient um, to see if this patient has acute ischemia. So that's how you kind of use the algorithm to read an EKG. I think it's very helpful to kind of use this method when reading EKG because you won't miss big things. And as you can tell, just by kind of practicing multiple and multiple times, by looking at EKG, you could quickly run through the EKG within a few seconds and have all that information. So I hope that was helpful and thank you for listening.